Welcome to Activation Church Online. We want to know where you're watching from, so please let us know in the comments below. And if this is your first time joining us, text the word online to the number listed on your screen. Now, let's prepare our hearts for worship. I've seen your face No, I can't walk away I just want to be where you are And I just want to be near you Nothing like your love There is nothing like your love
sing holy, oh holy, 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 you are holy, holy, Jesus, I today, we wanted to take a minute and thank each and every one of you for supporting our church. We want you to know that your generosity is making a big difference. And if you'd like to give today, you can go to activationchurch.com and click on the donate button. It's safe, it's convenient, and it's really easy. Let's prepare our hearts for the word. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn it to Matthew, the 22nd chapter we're starting a brand new series today called Reasonable Response. And I want you to just turn to the person next to you and say, hey, it's only reasonable. It's only reasonable. Matthew 22, verse 36, Jesus is responding to a question. And this individual asked him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus is saying if you can get these two things right, everything's going to be all right. You know, if you go back to the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses, you can see that all of those, all ten of those commandments are actually answered in love. Because if I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If I love my wife, I'm not going to cheat on my wife. Like, like, she doesn't have to remind me every day, remember what God said, don't commit adultery. It is a natural response Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is a natural response. Because I love her, I'm not going to cheat on her. Because I love people, I'm not going to still, I'm not going to lie. Are you understanding? It's just, it's a natural response to this love. And Jesus says, if you can get these two things right, of loving God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and then loving your neighbor as yourself, everything's going to be 
okay. But the first question I want to ask this morning is why would we love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and why would we love our neighbor? And because Jesus said to is not a good answer. Not for everyone. Like, really, like this God that's out there, why would we choose to love him? Why would we choose to serve him? Why would we choose to take time out of our schedule to come meet at a church on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock when we could be doing anything else? I don't know about you, but there are other things I could be doing this morning. I'm not here because it's like the only thing I got going on. Why would we do that? Why would we take time? Why would we serve? Why would we give? Uh, for those of you who come in throughout the week and you clean the church, why would you do that? The people that are downstairs with our kids in the nursery and then in the A Kids program, like why would they, why would they do that, Amanda? Why would they take their time to go be with kids when there's other stuff that they could be doing? Why would we love God? with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and why would we want to love our neighbor as ourself? And I'm going to give you the cliff note version of this. Are you ready? The cliff note version of this is found in 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 19. And it simply says, we love because he first loved us. Are you seeing that? We love because he first, he first loved us. So in other words, he pursued us. We didn't pursue him. So our love for him is just a response back to the great love that he has poured out to us. I serve because he first served me. I give because he first gave for me. I love because he first loved me. And he demonstrates this love to us. How many of you know it's not enough to just say, I love you? God didn't just say, Bill, I love you. Go on your merry way. He actually demonstrates it. How many of you wives out there want your husband to demonstrate their love? Husbands out there, you want your wife to demonstrate that love. Why? Because that's how love works. When you love someone or something your love will be demonstrated, and God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for me to fix it. Are you seeing that, Justin? He didn't wait for me to perfect my life. He didn't wait for me to fix some things because I can't. And a lot of times people get it wrong when they think, you know what, I'll fix some things and then I'll serve God. That's the wrong attitude. He loved me first. He loved me while I was still a sinner. While I was still an enemy of him, he chose, he chose, he chose to die for me. John 3, 16, everybody knows this. For God so what? Loved the world. How did he demonstrate that love? By sending his only begotten son. And now whoever believes in him does not have to perish. They don't have to die, but they can have eternal life. Now get this. Jesus, who is God, who has always been God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the entire universe, left the comforts of heaven where he was seated on the throne. No pain and no problems. It was all right for Jesus. Turn to the person next to you and say, it was all right for Jesus. And yet, he demonstrates his love by leaving that place to come live in human flesh where he suffers, where he's mocked, where the people he is reaching out to reject him. They ultimately hang him on a cross and kill him. Why? Because he was demonstrating his love for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, love has to be demonstrated. Love has to be demonstrated. And when we understand the magnitude of his love for us and what he went through to demonstrate that love to us, it's only our reasonable response to love him in return. I want to show you how this is illustrated in Luke, the seventh chapter, verse 36. 
Luke 7, verse 36. Turn to the person next to you and say, we're going somewhere. We're going to get there, too. Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. So this guy says, Jesus, come eat with me. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he, being Jesus, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Check, I, I want you to really visualize this morning. As I'm reading this, I want you to see this woman, this sinner, who finds out that Jesus is in, the, in her neck of the woods. She comes into the house, and she stands behind him, and she starts to weep, so much so that her tears are falling on his feet. And she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this was that was touching him, for she is a sinner. In other words, Jesus should not be having any kind of connection with a girl like this. And if he truly is who he claims to be, then he would tell her to get out of here because I don't need you touching me. I don't need your tears falling on me because you're dirty and I don't want to get dirty. Are you hearing that? Are y'all you, you following this? So the Pharisee is challenging what's going on in his mind. And Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Now get this. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. So two of these guys owe someone some money. And there was no way they could pay this debt. There wasn't enough work they could do. There wasn't enough second jobs they could do. There wasn't a second mortgage they could take on their house. There was no way for them to pay this debt. And they come to this person saying, hey, we can't pay. And he has mercy on them and cancels both of their debt. And Jesus says, now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. Oh, this is powerful right here, church. Because this is a man, this Pharisee is a man who spent his entire life studying the scriptures. He is waiting for the coming king. He is waiting for the Messiah and the Messiah has stepped into his house, and he doesn't even recognize it. And Jesus says, do you see this woman? I entered your house, Simon, and you gave me no water for my feet. You wouldn't even do me the honor of allowing me to wash off my feet, which was a normal thing there. So in other words, he's not seeing the Messiah. He's seeing someone from Nazareth. He's seeing a common person a common man and he's treating him that way you gave me no water for my feet but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair you gave me no kiss but from the time I came in she has not ceased to kiss my feet you did not anoint my head with oil but she has anointed my feet with ointment therefore I tell you her sins which are many her debt is great, are forgiven, has been canceled. For she loved, what? Much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. This is a great accusation against Simon the Pharisee. 
You think you got it all together. You think you've got your life figured out. You think that you're holy because you keep all these ceremonies and these rituals. And because of that, you don't know or understand your need for the Savior. But this woman, she knows she's a sinner. She knows she's filthy. She knows that she's in need of a Savior. And she has responded to me well. She has honored me. She has loved me in return because she understands that my love has forgiven her of much. Are you seeing what I'm saying, church? It is our reasonable response when we understand that he has canceled the debt against you to simply return to him and respond to him by giving your love back to him. It's not unreasonable. See, when we are in relationship with human beings... Our relationship is built based upon, first, the law of attraction. I think you look good. You think I look good. Or there's something about me that you like, which there's many things about me that you could possibly like. One is my humility. <laughs> but, but first, it's attraction. But then our love is built based upon, you know, developing that relationship. But it's not like that with God. God just loved us, not based upon anything that we did. And he demonstrated that love. And so it's just a natural response that, man, God, why would you love me? Why would you do this for me? Why would you die for me? Why would you suffer for me? And now that I understand that you gave everything, that you laid your life down as a sacrifice, it is only reasonable that I, in return, would lay down my life and love you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what, as a living sacrifice. Then he says, this is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable. God has demonstrated his love for you. It is not unreasonable for you to respond by demonstrating your love to him. He took me out of darkness and pulled me into his marvelous light. I was a nothing and a no one, but now he has made me a son. He's made you a daughter. Are you getting that? You're not an alien. You're not a foreigner. You are actually a child of the living God. So my only reasonable response to this kind of love is to love him back. But what does that kind of love look like? What would a reasonable response to his love look like? And I want to show you what it should look like in this same story that we just read of the woman from a different perspective written in Matthew 26. And if you're taking notes, write down it's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. Not only does he show us his love by what he did, but it was a sacrificial offering that he gave to us. So Matthew 26, 6. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with her alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. Somebody say very expensive. The stuff wasn't cheap. This wasn't the stuff that you get in the gas station where you put a quarter in and you get to have a couple of sprays of the stuff. Some of you have been in places where you walk into the men's room and they want to dash you down with the, the fake Hugo Boss. Some of you are acting way too holy. I've never been in a place like that, Pastor. Not me. I've never been in a place where somebody wants me to give them $5 for handing me a hand towel. <laughs> Some of you in here, you feel guilty right now. <laughs> but this was... Very I'll drink to that. Still water. 
One day it's going to turn into wine, I promise. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bad pastor. I promise you this, you'll never find another pastor like me, ever. <laughs> ever. Thank you. That did so much for my humility. Thank you. <laughs> so she comes up to Jesus with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. And she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they, were, they, they got mad. They were angry, saying, why this waste? Why this waste? Somebody remember that, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Jesus, what she just did cost her something, and it could have been used in a better way. What she had could have been sold, and that money could have been given to the poor. But Jesus, Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. So everybody's bothered by what this woman has done. She's poured out this expensive box of oil, and they saw it as a waste, but she saw it as a reasonable response. In light of everything that Jesus has done for me, it's only reasonable that I would give him my best. If you invited someone over to your house for dinner, let's say this was an important person. You invited them over to your house for dinner. I promise you're going to do a few things. You're going to make sure that house is tidy. You're going to cook the best thing you know how to cook. It may just be cinnamon buns. But if that's the best you can do, that's what you're going to do. Am I right? You're not going to invite someone important over for dinner and then walk in and you go, uh, just find a seat anywhere. Just kind of whatever's on the couch, just kind of shift it over. And uh, there's a TV tray if you want to grab it. Let me go look in the fridge, see what we got left over from uh, this past Sunday's dinner. Jesus, you want some spaghetti? Kids didn't really like it, so there's plenty of that left. Are you seeing that? We would never do that to someone important. We would never give them leftovers. Why? Because the gift is determined by the level of honor. So when you see this woman... It was not a waste. It was, I am honoring. This is the king who has entered the house. This is the one who will bleed and die for me. I recognize who he is. I recognize what he will accomplish. And it is only reasonable that I would honor him for who he is. Why? Because love is sacrificial. Love is Give sacrificially. And if you love something or someone, you will sacrifice for that thing or that person. Am I right? You know that when it comes Christmas time. Your money may be tight, but you will sacrifice to be able to make sure that those kids have Christmas. You may not be able to afford $8,000 to go to Disney World. Why it costs so much money to go to Disney World, I have no idea. You may not be able to afford, that may be, a, I mean, that's a, a Disney, let's just say, let's just get real. Disney's a lot of money, am I right? Yeah. And you may not be able to afford it, but you will put three months wages back to go to Disney because you love Disney and you love your children. Why? Because love sacrifices. It's just how it works. If you love something or you love someone, You'll give to that sacrificially. So others may see what you do at your church as a waste. Why would you waste your time going? Why would you waste your time serving? Jimmy, why would you waste your time to learn the songs you got to learn to get up here and play bass on a Sunday morning? Why? That's a waste. Why would you do that? And that's how the mind of the world works. They see it as a waste. Why would you give of your time, your effort, 
your talents, your money. Why would you do that? That's a waste. But to me, it is only reasonable in light of what Jesus has done for me to take everything that I have and everything that I am, not the leftovers of me, but the best of me and say, Jesus, this belongs to you because I recognize who you are and I honor you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Whenever I do anything, whenever I do anything, if I give to the church, I don't see giving as an obligation. I see giving as an opportunity to honor God. See, that's what the Bible says. It says, honor me with your wealth. It's not enough to just tell Jesus you love him. That love will be demonstrated and it will be sacrificial. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I do it because I love him and I understand what he has accomplished for me and I understand who he is and it only makes sense that I will give him the best of me. Not the leftover spaghetti in the fridge. That's why I do what I do. You know, when it comes to even giving financially to the church, people may look at what I do and go, well, that's a waste. You could do this. You could do that. I remember someone telling me one time, years ago, back before I was pastoring a church, they were talking about giving to the church, and they were like, you know, I could buy a car with that money. Like, if I didn't give it to the church, I could buy a car with that money. I'm thinking, like, are you, I almost said freaking, but I won't say that <laughs> because you'll, get, you'll look too whole. Are you freaking kidding me? You'll put a car before what you'll do for the church, for the kingdom of God to advance his purpose. You'll put this or that before honoring God. Are you kidding me? Not a chance. Listen, have nice things. I'm for it. Buy new things. I'm for it. But God has to be a priority in our life. He cannot take second seat. He is first. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end. He is the preeminent God. And one day we will stand before him and he'll look at each and every one of us and say, how did you honor me? That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? I gave you my life. How did you respond with your time? Well, God, you know I was busy. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching. You know I was busy. It was travel ball season, Jesus. So I, you know, I was just really busy. How, what did you do with your talents? Well, I mean, I did this, I did this, I did this. Yeah, but what did you do for me? What are we doing in return? How are we responding to him in light of everything that he's done for us? To me, it's only reasonable. Because if you love something or you love someone, you'll invest into it. Am I right? If you look at your bank statements or your credit card statements when you get home, you'll see who or what it is that you love. And don't judge me for loving Taco Bell. <laughs> I love Jesus more. <laughs> but are you seeing what I'm saying? Many times we say things with our mouth that our life doesn't back up. And Jesus says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. What's he saying about that? He's saying, you're saying the right things. But when it really comes down to it, your heart is far from me. You've made this your God. You've made that your God and not me. You've not honored me in a way that is reasonable in response to what I've done for you. And I can't put this off on you or those of you who are watching online. I'm not, I'm not just putting it off on you and saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. No, no, no. I'm start, I start with me. Am I giving God the best of my time? Am I giving God the best of my focus? Am I giving God the best of my energy? Am I giving God the best of my life? Am I, put, am I really putting him first? Church, we need a people who will gather together and say he is first. He is all that matters. And I will do whatever it takes to push his kingdom forward. 
there are so many people in this world that need to hear the message of Jesus, and it will come through you putting him first. My, I get so sad when I think about the state of the church, Big C, right now. Because through all of this, so many have shown their cards. They've shown what really matters to them. And if we're not careful, we're going to allow what God is wanting to do in this season to pass us by. Well, God's will will be done. Yes, it will, but it may not be done through you. Because he will find a people. You hear what I'm saying? He will find a people who will love him and honor him, and he will do great exploits through them. I'm not missing that train. I'm not missing it. I want to do whatever it takes to do and accomplish something great for his kingdom. I want to be a part of the reason that lives are transformed. I want to be a part of the reason that lives are changed. I want to be a part of the reason that marriages are restored. I want to be a part of the reason that people receive physical healing, emotional healing, financial healing. I want to be a part of that because that's really all that matters. Please hear that. That's all that really matters. When you really think about life and how temporary it is, that's all that matters. is what you do for the kingdom of God. Nothing else will matter. Think about the man Jesus talks about. He, he gathered all this stuff, all of this wealth, so much so that he didn't have any place to put it. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger spaces, bigger places to store it. And then that man dies. And everything is left because he couldn't take it with him. And he said, you stored up treasures for yourself on earth, but you have nothing stored up for you in heaven. What are we working for? What are we working towards? What is it that we want to accomplish? Do we want our life to matter? Do we want what we do to count? It can. But it's going to happen by each and every person doing what they can do and working together and serving together and loving together and giving together. When we do that, if we will come into church, hear what I'm saying, if we will come into that kind of unity where we say, I'm going to do my best, I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to do it together with the person sitting next to me and the person across the room. When we do that, we will see a city shaken. That's when we'll become that light to the city. That's when we'll become the salt to the earth. Because people will look at us and say, that's a person who has put God first. For those of you who are watching online or listening by podcast, I want to pray for you first. And I'm asking today that God would begin to just speak to your heart and your life. That he would cause a hunger inside of you like never before. A desire to serve him and to love him with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. Why? Because he loved us first with everything. So Father, I'm asking that you would touch them and move in their life in a mighty and a powerful way. Maybe there's someone watching right now or maybe there's someone in the room Right now, you've never considered the magnitude of his love and how he demonstrated it for you. And right now, I invite you to respond to that love by saying, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, change me, save me. Begin to make him a priority and watch what he does for you. So, Father, move and touch him. In Jesus' name, amen.